Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today I'm going to be doing a special video. I'm going to be doing a video on how to improve your middle game strategy. So if you're um, like a 1600 player, uh, this will really help you, um, you know, breaking through and getting to 1800 or 1900 or above. Uh, this is just a bunch of things that I've noticed that will really help 1600s um, get, get a lot better very, very quickly. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, uh, please go ahead and hit that uh, subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So something that I've noticed with people that are right around a certain rating range, like right around 1600, is that there seems to be like this laundry list of things that they don't do when they're playing middle games. And that laundry list of things that they don't do is actually pretty large. Um, there, there's a lot of stuff that I would put into that category. They don't seem to follow plans very well. They tend to make a lot of moves that are disconnected from each other. Uh, they tend not to be able to find Zishin Zooks. Those are in-between moves, if you don't know what those are. Uh, they, they're, they, they don't... Um, uh, they don't do the three things that I'm going to cover in this video, uh, which is uh, they don't anchor their pieces. Um, so they have a lot of pieces that are what I like to call floating. They're very bad at anchoring. Um, they're very bad at making moves like Luft or making safety moves. Uh, they're, they're very bad about breaking pins if they don't see a direct threat. 1600s, for the most part, will only do something if it's put directly in front of them and it's less than a move away. So if they see a one-move threat or a two-move threat, uh, then they'll meet it. Another thing that 1600s are really bad at is they always break tension way too quickly. Um, strong players will keep tension forever. They don't care. You know, they, they'll have two pieces facing off ready to capture each other or two pawns facing off ready to capture each other and they'll just leave them like that forever. Um, but 1600s, they, they can't let it go. F if it goes for more than three moves, they'll simply capture something um, just because they can't take it anymore. So there's this this huge laundry list of things that you have to fix uh, with your middle games, and we'll talk about three of them uh, today. So the three things that you really need to fix, the three things that we're going to cover are um, what I like to call anchoring, and this is a really important concept. Uh, the next thing is breaking your pins, and that's a super important concept. And then the, the last thing is um, making luft and... I, making luft and also making safety moves or prophylaxis moves. So we can put that kind of into the same category. And you need to start incorporating these things into your into your play if you want to improve your results. So let's give a couple examples of this. So one thing that people don't cover a lot is something called anchoring. So I'm going to give an example out of the Evans Gambit. So this is one of my favorite openings. If you don't play the Evans Gambit, if you're 1600, I recommend playing it because you're going to learn a lot of stuff that is important. And that's another mistake I think that 1600s make is they try to play these very, very safe openings. You know, like the, a lot of people, like they play London systems and all this other stuff. I recommend, you know, play some gambits, not some of the more crazy gambits, but just play a gambit like the Evans Gambit or even the King's Gambit because you're going to learn a lot of tactical concepts and a lot of middle game concepts that you're going to be able to use in other parts of your game. And if you play something like a London where your pieces are naturally anchored, you're never going to have to learn how to anchor them, to take them from an unanchored situation and then anchor them. So basically, uh, this is what I call anchoring. So we have, you know, b4, bishop takes b4, c3, bishop a5. So already, I want you to take a look at this bishop here on a5. And this is a really important concept. This bishop is not anchored. This bishop is a loose piece. Okay, now this is really important. I mean, it doesn't seem important right now. There's no direct threat. And again, this is the mistake that a lot of B players make, is they think, well, since there's no direct threat, I don't have to do anything right now. The truth is, is that you would actually like to anchor this piece at its earliest possible convenience. Because the longer this piece sits here, the longer there is some danger of something bad happening to it. Okay, it, it, it doesn't have to be something that you calculate right away. Just the fact that this possibility exists should lead you to want to anchor that piece so that you can move the rest of your pieces freely. So like one example is like, let's say we play d4 and you play d6. Now this is by far and away considered the main line. 
Now, if white were to castle here, you should immediately anchor your piece. This actually has a name. This is called the Lasker defense. As soon as you anchor your piece, your position is actually relatively safe once you play bishop b6. Now, if you don't anchor your piece, you can actually get into some pretty immediate uh, trouble uh, with, with not anchoring your piece. One of the threats that that white actually has here is to play d5. So let's say that you were to play something like queen e7 because you felt like, well, I need to play queen e7 so that I can fortify the square so that white doesn't open up the position. This would actually lose a piece immediately to d5, knight b8, and queen a4 check. And now this loose piece is being picked up. And this is something that you need to keep in mind. Um, there, there's also possibilities of this piece being picked up uh, via some tactic like this, where the queen could hit here and here. And there's also possibilities of this piece being picked up with the queen going to d5, where we would have a similar type of threat, where we're hitting the a5 bishop in the f7 square. And of course, all of these possibilities do occur. So like one example is if you follow the main line, which is not castles, the main line is actually queen b3. Uh, we have to be very cautious about losing this loose bishop. So we have to actually be very cautious about how we defend against this threat of bishop takes f7, of course, followed by, you know, if bishop f7, king d7, queen e6 would be mate. So if bishop f7, king f8, uh, basically white would be winning a pawn. So we have to defend this pawn. We actually have to be very careful about how we defend it, whether we defend it with queen e7 or queen d7, because this bishop on a5 is simply not anchored yet. So black would have to be very, very cautious, and black would have to play queen d7 to make sure that white doesn't have the move d5 followed by queen b5 check. If we were to play queen e7 instead, it is actually possible for white to play d5, knight b8, and then queen b5 or a4 check picks up that loose bishop, because the queen, of course, is no longer defending it, so we don't have the move pawn to c6 to defend that bishop. So that's a really important concept, is, is anchoring this piece at your earliest convenience. Because when you don't anchor um, this piece, there's always going to be the possibility that something bad can happen to it, uh, even if something bad doesn't happen to it right away. Now that's also an important concept when it comes to pins. So let's take a normal opening that we would see at like the 1600 level. So let's take an Italian game. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at just a straightforward, basic kind of quiet game where we just play d3, so we're not going to play the oven's gambit, and then knight of 6 and then white is going to go ahead and make a pin. Now, as soon as white makes this pin, a good player would break this pin as soon as possible. And this is a really, really important concept. When you get pinned in chess, don't just leave that pin hang out for like, you know, five, six moves because you don't see anything that's going to cause a problem right away. As long as you have a pinned piece, at the very least, that pinned piece is not going to be able to move. And that's a problem. Um, that's a problem for your mobility. So the biggest way that you can fix your mobility issue in the near term is just to, to immediately kick this bishop. Now, I think a lot of 1600s, a lot of people in this crowd, they think, well, I can kick this bishop any time. Why do I need to rush to do it right away? Why can't I just do something else? Because the most important thing that you can do in this position at this moment is kick that bishop. Everything else can take a sideline right now. Nothing else matters. So that's really, you have to prioritize that. And the reason you have to prioritize it is if you do something else, even in just this position where you go, well, there's no threat. You know, he's not threatening to, to take it. You know, he's not threatening to pile on to the knight. He's not threatening to play knight d5 on this move. Why should I immediately try to break this pin? If we don't do it now, things get worse. So if we were to, say, castle and then wait for knight c3, now there is a threat. Now our options are very limited. Actually, now, in order to break the pin, we would actually have to undevelop one of our developed pieces. We would have to play bishop e7, and then white should actually reply with a prophylaxis move. White should play the move pawn to a3 and just make an escape score for his bishop so he doesn't lose the bishop pair with bishop a2 and guarantee control of d5. We'll talk about that as, as the third 
thing that we need to do to improve our play. Make prophylaxis moves like this, like a3. This is something else that weaker players fail to do, that six, the 1600 crown has a real problem with. Um, why do we have to play bishop e7 here? Well, if we do anything else, like if we just develop, of course white's going to follow through with knight d5, and then this position will be completely winning. We're actually just threatening to take, play bishop h6, play knight h4 to, say, f5, and then bring this queen in for a decisive attack against the king. We're basically just going to mess up the pawns in front of the king at this point and obtain a winning position. And it, you might think, well, I can play h6 now. Sure, but the position has changed. Black is now castled. So now when you play h6, white can simply retreat and say, are you really going to play g5? Because now if you play g5 after bishop g3, white's going to continue with queen d2 and h4, and your king position is going to be completely indefensible. And you could have solved all of this by playing h6 right away, even though it didn't look like there was any reason for you to do this immediately. But if you had played h6 right away, your position would have been just fine. Your white now has to make this decision right away. If he retreats, you can go ahead and play g5, and your king is not castled. So you can always castle queenside. Uh, if after h6 he takes, you can simply take back with the queen. And again, this isn't a big deal if he decides to play knight c3, knight d5 right here. You have time to retreat, you have time to play d6, you even have time to play a prophylaxis move of your own and play a move like pawn to a6 so you don't lose that bishop pair. And everything is going to be okay, but you have to do these things um, as soon as possible. You have to do these things at the earliest possible convenience. You have to break your pins at your earliest possible convenience. You have to anchor your pieces at your earliest possible convenience. And you also need to make luft at your earliest possible convenience. So I'll give one example of this, which I think is almost an insane example. I, I don't even know if this was a real game, to be totally honest. In theory, it's a real game, but it could have been constructed. But it's actually pretty instructive of kind of what not to do. Um, this was actually a game that I'm going to show. It's a pretty famous game. It was a game between played between Adams and Torre. Uh, played in New Orleans in 1920. So if you got a copy of like the world's greatest chess games ever played, this one is actually in there. Um, but that game continued d4, ed4, queen d4, uh, knight c6 got played, bishop b5, bishop d7. So he does break that pin immediately, takes, takes, but he gets to keep this queen in the center of the board so white has more space. Knight c3, knight f6, uh, castles kingside, bishop e7, knight d5, takes, takes castles, bishop g5. So now I want to point out that black is actually going to be a-ok -okay if at any point he plays h6. Black's position is fine. There's nothing wrong with black's position. Now you might be asking, well, why do we need to play h6? We already broke this pin. There's no pin here. Well, what is h6? h6 is simply a lift move. That's all it is. Lift means making air. And sometimes we need to make look for our king. Um, also, sometimes we need to make prophylaxis moves so like our bishop can retreat and stuff like that. And those moves are really important. And it's actually really important to make those moves at your earliest possible convenience, even if you don't see an immediate threat. Because the longer we let this sit, the longer we don't make luft, the longer there is this possibility of a threat happening. Okay, even if we don't see it. But more importantly, it ties our pieces down. Right now, the most important thing black can do to improve his position is play h6. Why? Because right now, even though you don't necessarily see it, you don't see an immediate combination, all of black's pieces are tied down to the back rank. These pieces have to stay on the back rank. I know that sounds insane. There's no direct threat. Why do they have to stay on the back rank? Because the back rank is what we call weak. White actually has the same problem. White's back rank is also weak. White should be considering the same thing. White should be considering just making luft at his earliest possible convenience. Because white's back rank is also weak. Okay, both people have a weak back rank. Which means that if I evacuate the back rank with my rooks, my queens, etc., I could lose to a back rank check. Now, it doesn't, now I know when you say that, you think, oh, well, so I just have to be careful and I have to calculate that there's no back rank check. But understand this, this is a peace mobility issue. We teach younger players that you have to try to get your pieces out, get your pieces out, get your pieces out, get your pieces in the middle of the board, get your pieces developed, get your pieces to the other side of the board. 
we teach them this. But you can't move your pieces if there's a weakness on your back rank. You can't move them. So if I play the move h3, here's the way I want you to think of Luft. If white plays h3 right now, I just developed two rooks. Right now my rooks cannot develop. Not naturally, not cleanly, not perfectly, not without risk. As soon as I play h3, both of my rooks can develop. So h3, even though it looks like a nothing move, would develop two pieces. And same thing for black. If black plays h6 in this position, at this move or any other move, he's developed three pieces. Okay, and that's how you need to think about prophylaxis moves. That's how you need to think about luft. That's how you need to think about breaking pins. You're developing. When you break a pin, you're developing that pinned piece. Okay, because that piece is not an active participant in the game while it's pinned. So that is the most important thing that you can do for your position in that moment. And right now for black, the most important thing he can do in this position before he does anything else is to play h6. Now in this case, he didn't do it. He played c6 and he struck in the middle. White defended the center because he's getting attacked in the center. There was an exchange in the middle of the board. Rook e8. Notice he never ever plays h6. Instead, he just continues to develop pieces. And eventually, he falls for this tactic. White was able to play bishop f6, bishop f6, and there's this huge issue still on the back rank. None of these pieces can move, and white takes full advantage of it. And if you can see it, go ahead and pause the video and see if you can find it. So moves queen g4. He distracts the queen because there's still a back rank threat. At no point did black play h6 and make luft. So now all of black's pieces are tied to the back rank. So if you don't see what's wrong, if, if black were to play queen to uh, g4, we have rook e8, rook e8, rook e8 is mate. See, none of black's major pieces in this position are actually developed. They, they're they tied down. They can't do anything. So the game continued really beautifully. It went queen b5, and then the queen made another really cool uh, you know, double sacrifice. Nothing can take that queen again because of the back rank threats. And then after queen d7, the queen sacrificed itself again with queen c7 because, again, none of these pieces can move. And then after queen b5, there was a very cute finish, a4, queen a4, and then rook e4. And again, everything's tied down very beautifully. You know, we can't play queen e4. We can't, if, if queen e4, we just play rook e4, and then nothing can be captured. So queen e4, rook e4, and then you can't capture either one of these pieces because the other one will deliver a back rank mate threat. And none of this would have been possible without the back rank mate threats. So the game continued queen b5, and then simply queen b7, and then black had to resign because this queen has nowhere to go. And of course, if queen takes b7, we're simply going to play rook takes rook, and the game is over, right? Or we could play, I guess we could try rook e4, and then we're going to have queen c8, and then whatever goes to e8 gets captured. And again, the back rank threat is going to tell the tale. Okay, so incorporate these three middle game concepts into your game. And remember that doing these things has to become a priority. It's not a side note. It's not, when I get around to it, I'll make Luft. Making Luft effectively develops your entire back rank. So keep that in mind when you make a Luft move. Making a safety move or making a prophylaxis move, like making a square for your bishop to retreat to, that effectively protects your entire center. You know, so if we go back to this prophylaxis move that we were talking about with pawn to a3, so if we go back to this stuff where we said, okay, we're going to play d3, knight f6, bishop g5, and then we're going to have uh, black play h6, and then, uh, and then we're going to have black play, uh, I think I had castles, was one of the variations. And then we're going to see knight c3. And then here we're going to have bishop e7. The correct move was a3. The reason this is such an important move is because this prophylaxis move guarantees control of the d5 square. So it's a priority to protect our center. If we don't protect our center, in this case, black can play knight a5, knight captures bishop, and then he can play d5. But if we play a3, d5 is never on the table. So now if knight a5, we simply play bishop a2, and d5 is not going to be on the table on the next move or the move after that. 
right? So we have to prioritize this because it falls back into basic principles. If we break our pins at our early convenience, we are developing our pieces and we're protecting the center. And these things have to be prioritized. That's the critical thing. It's not just that you do them or that you do them eventually. You have to prioritize them and you have to do them immediately. We have to anchor our pieces immediately. We have to break our pins immediately and we have to make luft immediately at your earliest possible convenience. Now, if you're 1600 and you don't do these things, if you start doing them, this is a big rating jump right away. I, I'm, I'm serious about this because these are the things that I see that 1600s don't do. They almost never do them. And as soon as you start incorporating these things into your game, you're going to see a big improvement. Okay, well, anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and uh, thank you very much for watching.